Welcome everybody to the opening launch event of Vital Week, where over the coming week, we as a sector will reflect, we'll discuss and share how and why we need to value teaching and learning in Irish higher education. Some short housekeeping just before we start. Uh, the event has been recorded. You'll have seen that as you came in. Um, the recording will be made available on our website after the event. And um, for those of you that would like to um, view the subtitles, you can turn them on by clicking uh, the subtitles uh, button at the bottom of your screen. Um, all week, our, uh, each of our events is going to be captured by our graphic um, illustrator, uh, Esther Blado. And um, I'm looking forward to Friday when we're going to review all of the illustrations as part of the closing event. But it now gives me great pleasure to hand over to the chair of the National Forum, Dr. Lynn Ramsey, um, to officially launch Vital Week. Lynn. Thank you very Thank you. much, Terry, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be with you all today at the start of this week, focused on valuing Ireland's teaching and learning. Through this week and the remainder of November, we'll have over 70 events scheduled to take place across 20 higher education institutions, all with a common thread, valuing teaching and learning and seeing how this can be strengthened in the context of Irish higher education. When the current National Forum strategy was consulted on back in 2018, the need to strengthen the value placed on teaching and learning was a really strong theme. The pandemic highlighted the importance of teaching and learning in ways which none of us could have predicted. And as we continue to live, work and study through COVID-19, Vital Week gives us pause to reflect on what has happened to how we study, work, communicate and succeed, and time to consider how we can refresh our thinking and practices and ensure teaching and learning continues to receive the attention and support that re is required across our sector. A centrepiece of Vital Week will be Wednesday's launch by Minister Harris of the findings from the National Partnership Project, Next Steps for Teaching and Learning, Moving Forward Together. There will also be a dedicated focus on the scholarship of teaching and learning every afternoon through this week. Through Vital Week, the Next Step Project and our scholarship sh showcase, we're getting closer to fulfilling this vision of a valued and informed teaching and learning culture in Irish higher education. Before I introduce our keynote speaker, I'd like to take the opportunity to share with you some views from the sector on why this national focus on valuing teaching and learning is so important. In preparation for today's event, we asked a number of staff and students across the sector why they thought valuing teaching and learning is vital. Let's hear what they had to say. Principally because teaching and learning is the core, is core to the mission of everything that we do in, in higher education. Um, universities and colleges were established with the centres of learning. But I think in addition, it's through our own teaching that our learning and knowledge is challenged, tested, refined and improved. It's, it's pretty clear that the quality of teaching and learning in the Irish higher education system is vital. Uh, we, we need to make sure those quarter of a million young people have the highest quality possible and with the most modern teaching and learning uh, methods, techniques, um, assessment opportunities, uh, learning outcomes um, that they can <clears throat> so that these young graduates and not so young graduates across the full range of academic profiles and business and economic and, uh, and enterprise profiles and all the cultural and social activities they'll get involved in as well so that they can bring this their full potential to these. Um, teaching and learning is valued in Trinity through academic achievement awards and the scholarship examinations. However, individual skills award those who attain excellent results during the year. While awards are great, communication between students and lecturers and TAs is vital. 
I've built up a good relationship with my lecturers and this summer my dissertation supervisors have commended me on the work over the last particularly difficult year. Um, while awards look brilliant on the CV, words of encouragement from academic staff are also essential to encourage students by recognising the students' efforts and pushes them to achieve. I think the first thing to recognise is that there are a lot of competing agendas in higher education. Um, and I think the first thing to say is that good teaching and good pedagogical practice takes quite a lot of expertise and effort. Um, and I think that there needs to be recognition that um, that expertise is both within the discipline itself, but also pedagogical. Um, and as a core activity within higher education, uh, I think we need to recognize its significance in terms of the contribution that it makes. And we often don't talk about contribution. For AHEAD as an NGO focused on creating inclusive environments in education and employment for people with disabilities, we understand that the classroom is right at the heart of learning and the teacher is at the heart of the classroom. And that's why we place huge stock in our work on promoting inclusive pedagogical frameworks like universal design for learning. Because if the pedagogy isn't inclusive, then the door to learning is already halfway closed for many individuals. So we really understand the powers that teachers have to make a difference in people's lives. I think if you ask most people of the functions of the university, they'll point to teaching and research. And in many ways, to me, those are really kind of academic Siamese twins. It's very hard to separate the two. <clears throat> but I think research without dissemination can very easily become quite sterile. And it's very important for us to nurture the next generation of scholars through our teaching. And also, I think there's a societal value. Um, we need to teach our students to think intensively and critically, and that largely comes through teaching activity. By valuing teaching and learning in higher education, we can start to see students and teachers work together in student partnership approaches and start to reap the benefits of them as well, which I'd be a huge advocate as a, a, a huge advocate of as well. Um, I think Vital Week is great for this because we can showcase best practices around teaching and learning and then other teachers can start to pick up the tips here and there and maybe adapt their practices or reflect on their own. When teaching and learning is valued, students feel cared for and empowered to achieve. They could be inspired themselves to look into research, to, be, to become really passionate about a certain area. If they see somebody's really passionate about an area, they're more likely to be inspired into looking into that as well. And I think someone being so passionate about an area can really be passed through to other people through really quality teaching and learning. Uh, perhaps in the past we've seen it as some kind of dual system whereby we have subject expertise and then bolted onto that we have the ability to teach um, and the uh, challenges that people face when they're trying to learn that particular subject. Um, and I feel that's not the entire picture. For me, subject expertise incorporates not just the expertise intrinsic to the subject itself, but also an understanding of the um, ways in which people can acquire the skills, knowledge and dispositions of that subject. And that's, that's a pedagogy, that is a teaching and learning expertise that's built into and forms part of the subject expertise. So therefore the notion of vitality is perfect for this particular a uh, series of events. You know, why is teaching and learning vital in higher education? Um, I mean, well, if it's not vital in higher education, then, you know, we have a bigger question in a way to be asking. Um, so teaching and learning assessment and student engagement are absolutely core to, to what we're about um, as a university. We're, we're here to turn out, I think, um, and to help people develop professionally in terms of their knowledge, their academic excellence, their technical excellence, but also as, as, as people. So what's the essence of graduateness? You know, are our graduates ready you know, in terms of knowledge, um, willing in terms of confidence um, and able to, 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 to speak up, um, to be politically and socially aware, um, to be mindful of our environment, to think about equality, diversity and inclusion. Um, and also to, to, to contribute, actually, whether that's to work or enterprise, um, to the economy, but also to society. Um, if we're not getting that, and it's, it's through teaching or learning or assessment, um, our student engagement, um, that kind of, that, the, the work that we do in those spaces are, are crucial, actually, um, to our mission of uh, turning out um, 
good graduates and it's the essence of, of what we do. Uh, I think, uh, just to step again back from that, I think everything we do in higher education is vital, but I think it's nice to have this lens now from the National Forum, which is focusing on the work, the, key, the core work that we do, because it is the core work we do. Um, th th it's an absolute privilege to teach students. Um, it's difficult to assess them sometimes, but at the same time, it's core to our work. Um, and so valuing um, that type of work is, is really, really important. And I'm delighted that um, the forum are focusing in on scholarship as well, because um, I, I suppose Ireland is unusual, maybe in comparison to other jurisdictions, um, in that our staff primarily come into teaching without having a formal teaching qualification. And yet, they are encouraged and they are supported within their, their, their institutes to ensure that they are not only up to date in their discipline specific knowledge, but also in terms of the knowledge around the whole discipline area of learning, teaching and assessment. And so the fact that the forum are again putting this lens on valuing this is really, really important so that we see um, being up to date being able to engage in new pedagogic approaches, being able to use digitally enhanced approaches, etc., is really, really important. But for me, the key thing is that it's evidence-based. So we're not doing it for the sake of doing it. We're doing it because we have um, we have researched it, we have seen what where best practice is, and we are then adapting to suit our own contexts. Um, and so I think it's really, really important that we name it. We say research is important, but value our core area of learning, teaching and assessment is just as important. I think it's really vital because teaching and learning is what we do. It's sometimes considered our job, but we actually don't think about how we practice it. So I think it's really important that we not only help people to become scholarly teachers, but we also support them in engaging with the scholarship, of teaching and learning through their practice. So again, it's about engaging and working with colleagues and also kind of helping each other to get out our practice and disseminate it and make sure that everybody shares the good resources that we are producing. Thank you very much, colleagues. Great to hear from our staff and students across the sector. Um, I'm delighted now to have the opportunity to welcome our keynote speaker, Professor Frank Cotton, Frank is the Senior Vice Principal and Deputy Chancellor Academic at the University of Glasgow, and he's also International Advisor to the Board of the National Forum. Frank. Thanks, Lynn. And, and first of all, let me say what a pleasure it is to be here uh, this week at the beginning of this great series of events that you've, you've got planned. What I, I, I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'll share my screen, um, but what I'm going to do today is actually I cover some of the ground that you saw in, in that introductory video, um, but also challenge you to think about how we value teaching and learning on a system-wide basis um, and not just from our own perspective. So for, for many colleagues in higher education, the value of teaching and learning is taken as a given. In fact, we heard that in the video. It's, it's just so integral to the nature of what we do. But what I'm going to argue today is that it's important that we don't fall into the trap of taking teaching and learning for granted. Um, because let's not for one minute assume that its value is consistently seen, even, even within higher education. And let's not also assume that the perceived value of teaching and learning in wider society is always strong, particularly when you consider it relative to other societal priorities. For me, the focus that the National Forum uh, Vital Initiative is putting on this important topic couldn't be more timely. Um, the COVID crisis has been a period where higher education has had to focus more intensively on the development of teaching and learning than it's had to for decades. And as we emerge from that crisis, there's a real opportunity to reflect on and to shape the value proposition for teaching and learning within the future higher education landscape. But as we do that, it's important to learn from the mistakes that we've made in the past. In my view, 
higher education is guilty of seeing the value of teaching and learning through its own lens and of engaging in a discourse that is very internally focused. I think going forward, it's critically important that academia avoids creating a concept of the value of teaching and learning that matters to it, but not to anyone else. So a key question then, sorry, my screen isn't advancing. There we are. A key question then is from what perspe perspective is the value perceived? Is it by um, the student, uh, a teaching faculty member or other member of university staff, the institution itself, business, industry, government, and or society more generally? I would argue that all of these matter actually, and that we need to build a narrative that all of these stakeholders recognize, can engage with, and that matters to them. For me, that's the only way to create the best conditions for the real value of teaching and learning to be unlocked. So how do we unlock that value? Um, and what does it mean for the, that range of stakeholders? Well, for society, teaching and learning creates and enhances our opportunities to improve quality of life, to address issues around social mobility, to underpin technological advancement, and to create capacity within society to tackle the grand challenges that humanity is facing. If we think about recent times, the research that higher education sustains globally rose to meet the COVID challenge, not only in terms of vaccination and treatment, but also in shaping the societal response. But let's remember where the human capacity to engage in that research came from. It came from teaching and learning, without which there would have been no researchers and no policy makers able to interpret and respond to that research. And then if we look at the government perspective, well, government priorities change over time, depending on who happens to be in power. But one constant that you will always find is that the economy underpins the entire manifesto of a government. So what is the economic value of teaching and learning in higher education? How would we evaluate that? Well, my own university, just as an example, recently commissioned London Economics to look at exactly this question. The study looked across all the activity of the university and estimated that the full economic impact of the University of Glasgow activity in 2018-19 on the UK economy was £4.4 billion. Pounds. Now, in relation to teaching and learning, it focused purely on the cohort of just over 8,000 students who began their studies in 2018-19 and looked at the net economic impact that they would have over their lifetimes. It concluded that the net economic impact on the labour market of the university teaching and learning experience for that cohort of students would be £734 million pounds in today's money. And of that, £401 million would be the net economic benefit to the students themselves, and £333 million would be the benefit to the exchequer. Now, the, the economic impact of learning and teaching associated with international students in their own labour markets wasn't covered as part of this study, but it's reasonable to assume that the, the impact there would be um, substantial as well. Now, the reason I wanted to, to use this example is that while these figures might seem completely disconnected to a colleague standing in a classroom, they actually matter to government economists and policymakers, and we need to be careful not to lose sight of that and to take the opportunity to underline how fundamental our teaching and learning is to the economy, and we should do that whenever we get the chance. And what about business and industry? Well, with business and industry, um, they see value primarily in the skilled workforce. And I would argue that sometimes that, that can be too narrow a focus um, because quite often that view is skewed by particular needs at a particular time. So particular skill sets, set requirements at a particular time. And that's exactly why engaging 
um, with business and industry, universities engaging with business and industry to develop a shared understanding of the broader value of teaching and learning is important, particularly around the value of higher level skills. Um, in reality, higher level skills are usually what allow businesses to respond to economic shocks, for example. Um, I want to give you just a very simple example of, of what I mean by this. So I, I was fortunate enough a number of years ago to meet with an alumnus of my university. And I'll, I'll explain the word alumnus slightly in a moment because I know you know what it all means, but this person technically wasn't an alumnus of the university. He was a board member in the Boeing Corporation, and he'd actually only studied on a study abroad program at the University of Glasgow. So he had never graduated from the university, but he um, viewed himself very much as an alumnus of the university. And, and I said to him, why is that bond so strong? And he said, well, it's, it's quite simple, really. He said, I was an engineering student at Caltech, and my degree program allowed me to study for a semester abroad in a completely different subject area. And I chose to study arts and humanities at the University of Glasgow. And he said, that semester at Glasgow studying arts and humanities taught me how to think differently. It taught me how to deploy my skills in a totally different way. And he said, I have no doubt, absolutely no doubt that that semester abroad is the reason why I am now operating at board level within this corporation. He said, it's that skill set that made me stand out from my, my peers. Um, now, that individual was able to articulate to me why the broader high level skills matter to him. And, and we as a sector need to be able to articulate that too, because quite often that message is lost. And we can be as guilty as any business sector of seeing the value of teaching and even, even within our own institutions. And I think we need to be careful not to do that, to see, um, to see teaching and learning only from our own disciplinary uh, perspective. We need to think more broadly than that. So, so far I've touched on how teaching and learning might be valued by those external to higher education. Um, but what I want to do now is focus on the higher education sector itself and the important role to play in engaging um, the sector in thinking holistically about uh, the value of teaching and learning. At institutional level, the value proposition of teaching and learning should be central to our strategic intent. Many universities refer to teaching and learning within their strategy documents. But that's not enough by itself. Um, you'll probably be aware that COP26 is currently underway in, in the city of Glasgow. And so to draw an analogy um, with some of the rhetoric around that event, there's a real danger that references to teaching and learning in university strategy documents could be just blah, 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 if we don't live by what we say. And to be clear, there are many great examples of universities not only putting teaching and learning at the heart of their strategies, but also clearly articulating its value for both internal and external audiences. And one example I would highlight, and I've highlighted it here on the slide, is the University of Melbourne, or the home of the, the influential Melbourne model. And, and its positioning of teaching and learning together with research and with external engagement as a triple helix of core priorities of the university. Each of those priorities shaping and reinforcing the other. In fact, Glenn Davies, the, the former vice chancellor of the University of Melbourne once said that without one of those three strands, the other two simply cannot exist. They simply cannot function. And he was very clear about that integral relationship between teaching and learning research and external engagement. And, and so within, the, within institutions, it is absolutely critical, I think, that we develop our institutional narratives in a way that actually is aligned to the way that we live our commitment to valuing teaching and learning and not simply some form of clever rhetoric. But if a university purports to value teaching and learning, the next question that follows is how does it evidence its commitment? 
And here there's a whole wide range of possibilities. And, and some of these were touched on earlier in the video. These can include staff development activity, not just at the early career stage, but throughout careers. And personally, I think that is very important in relation to teaching and learning. Ensuring career structures recognize and reward excellence in teaching and learning. And, and that, of course, includes promotions processes. There are other forms of recognition and reward for excellence in teaching, various award schemes, for example. We need to make sure that we make the right investment in our people, in our physical infrastructure and technology to support teaching and learning. And we should also be supporting communities of practice and the scholarship of teaching and learning and getting the policy frameworks right to support all of that is, uh, for me, an essential underpinning factor here. So the final, and, and one thing I would say here that I think is really important, and that is that you can have some of these in, in your institution, but if they don't connect and colleagues don't see them as a holistic supportive landscape, actually you lose the value of the individual initiatives. For me, that connection to create a holistic landscape that is universally supportive in terms of teaching and learning and tells you without even you having to ask the question that teaching and learning matters in your institution is something that we must absolutely strive for. The final group that I haven't really said much about um, so far is students. Well, when students don't value teaching and learning, the signs are pretty obvious. You get disengagement, disinterest, and it manifests as underachievement. And there are a variety of other different indicators as well. But when they do value teaching and learning, the result is rewarding for them. It's rewarding for the teachers and for the university. The current generation of students, just like the ones who came before them, want to make a difference. And arguably, we're in a better position to help them achieve that than ever before. Technology and developments in our approach to teaching have opened the door to engaging students pervasively in active learning and in the co-creation of learning and, and have created the opportunity to situate learning experience, experiences within societal contexts that really matter to students in a way that we couldn't have done in the past. Now, the flip side of all of this is that that is a great opportunity. And this, this week and the events around this will explore this, I'm sure, in great depth. But the flip side is that our students are a seriously discerning bunch. They know when we are not taking these opportunities. And increasingly, they will make their voices heard if we fail um, to deliver. I just wanted to to say something about student partnership to finish. For all of my academic career, I've been an advocate of staff and students working in partnership to unlock the true value of teaching and learning in higher education. And if anything, my own personal experiences have just reinforced that over time. Um, I, I want, you know, sometimes we, we, we trivialize the relationship with students and we should never do that. Students add so much value to our organizations and they see so much and they see it very clearly. Um, just, just as a, a very simple illustration, my university runs teaching awards, both through staff nominations, so you can nominate a colleague for a teaching award and it runs a student teaching award scheme and has done for the last 10 years. When we started the Student Teaching Awards, there was real concern that it might be a popularity contest and that the students would simply vote for the people that they liked. Well, what I can tell you is that having had more than 10 years experience in this, the overlap between the two schemes is absolutely enormous. We see the same names coming up on, in both of the schemes. And what we see on the student side is that they actually recognize people who are making a difference to their teaching and learning. So I would very much encourage you to develop your partnership with your students, but to think about that partnership as being at the core of a much wider proposition of the value of teaching and learning that, that extends beyond institutional boundaries out through business, industry, and government into society as a whole. Um, for me, to develop this proposition is, as the title says, vital. 
Thank you very much. I don't see any any uh, 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 questions coming through the chat, although lots of praise and thanks to Frank for a very stimulating and provoking uh, um, keynote. Uh, and lots of lots of good food for thought there. Frank, your your Boeing executive, who was only a visiting student, an international student in in Glasgow, what was it particularly that, if you remember, that that got him so engaged and so grateful for his 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 short brief um, engagement with with uh, teaching and learning in at the University of Glasgow? So the, 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 there were a couple of things actually. So one one was the the fact that when you when you study the likes of an engineering program, and as I say, his his uh, alma mater was uh, Caltech, you're very focused on analytical solutions. So a problem is posed, and you you immediately jump to the the, the analytic solution. Um, one of the things that the, the study of humanities gave, uh, gave was the actually just the interpretation of language. So when a problem is actually posed, um, the interpretation of the problem can actually be skewed by the way someone poses it. And so it, it, it made him then begin to think about how you interrogate a, a, a situation more effectively. And some of the critical analysis skills that we would apply to literature, for example, are equally applicable to a business scenario. And like so it. He, he found himself doing, basically using that skill set to, um, to, to analyze some of the, the sort of technical challenges that Boeing were facing at that time and put them in a slightly different context. That's, that's really interesting, Frank. Thank you. And isn't, isn't that part of our, our challenge is, is helping our students and our graduates ask the right questions. And isn't that a big challenge in modern life? We're not necessarily asking the right questions at all, or the questions that we're answering have been asked, uh, have been asked for us by other people and normally a very, very narrow, undiverse, non-diverse set of people and, uh, and determined through algorithms and all sorts of things. So another example of the importance of, of, of our diverse, ever, ever increasing diversity in the student body and help, helping them to shape the future through asking the right questions. Um, thank you. Uh, lots of praise coming through on the, on the, on the chat, Frank. Uh, so thank you so much. So I'm going to hand straight over back into Terry. So I, what I wanted to do is just before we hand over to Lewis officially for the, the first scholarship hour and to the Gosta Master, just to remind everybody of what we actually have um, coming up this week and until the end of November. Each day um, we're going to release um, voices from our sector. It's going to be a, a, a video with people in our sector talking about particular topics. Uh, tomorrow, I think we're talking about collaboration both between ourselves and also collaboration uh, with our international um, uh, colleagues. Uh, on the, the next day, we'll, we, we, we have a number of different videos, so we, we look forward to releasing those. The final videos on Friday will be what the sector thinks higher education is going to look like in 2030. Um, the, each day we're going to have a scholarship hour um, and our first scholarship hour is going to start just now and um, it's going to be led by the great GOSTA master Dr Tom Farley um, we need all, all support to actually do the GOSTA so there's going to be 26 lightning talks over the next um, five days but one of the things that the lightning talks do the, do is they do actually um, they do show uh, very much the breadth and range of what actually is happening in terms of teaching and learning scholarship across the sector. Um, our fellows are going to introduce three of the GOSTAs today, tomorrow and on Thursday, and a podcast of their interview with an international expert will be released after the event. And most importantly is that the, uh, that the, the week only starts a, a focus until the end of the month. And as, as Lynn said earlier, we've 70 events, so I'd urge you to go to our website and to look at the range of events and to attend as many as you can. So, Lewis, I'm going to hand back to you now to start our first scholarship hour.